Well, howdy, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to World History Class with Mr. Fulcher here at Wyman King Academy, which looks a little bit different than the last time you saw it, right? Uh, I'm going to try a new camera angle this time because last time my mom said that I looked fat with the camera angle. I think it has less to do with the camera angle and more to do with 30 years of shoveling meat lovers' pizza down my gullet. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll, we'll try the new camera angle here. And... Uh, uh, hope everyone's having a happy quarantine. Uh, hope everything's, uh, everyone's, uh, doing all right. Uh, today we get to talk about the Russian Revolution, um, which I probably should have thought of that before I wore this very revolutionary looking thing. I don't want to look like a sympathizer. Uh, communism is bad, children. Uh, but anyway, so today we're talking about the Russian Revolution, uh, and this is one of the most important events of the 20th century. Uh, it is in some ways a direct consequence of World War I, uh, and yet in, in the other ways um, it was kind of inevitable uh, in terms of uh, some of the weaknesses that had been existing in the Russian regime for a long period of time before the czars finally fell. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Paul and I think. I think. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so, I don't know. There's this weird thing going on with the color on the screen I'm looking at now. I don't know if it's going to be on the video or not. Hope, hopefully the picture's good. Uh, Anyway, so uh, when we last left off in Russian history, other than when we talked about World War I, uh, we had talked about the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. And Alexander II uh, is an individual who had tried to make some uh, kind of baby steps toward reform. Uh, he had been involved in uh, the freeing of the serfs and some other things. Uh, he didn't go far enough in uh, reform to please some of the radicals, though, who wanted to abolish the czarist system uh, or change the Russian government in more, uh, uh, more long-lasting ways. So he ultimately pays for, uh, you know, his moderation by actually being assassinated by one of the, the reform elements within Russia, which was a mistake on their part, because Alexander II dies, and he's replaced by his son Alexander III, and Alexander III is much less sympathetic uh, to any sort of uh, reform. Let's see if I can adjust this a little bit. I don't know what's going on with the picture. I hope you don't see that on the uh, thing. I don't know if it's a light flicker and what's going on there. So, um, so ultimately, uh, Alexander the, uh, the third is going to come to power and he is going to try to bring vengeance down on, uh, the elements that he blamed for the, his father's assassination. Uh, and, uh, that was basically all, everyone who wanted to move in the direction of democracy or, or what they would call liberalism in the 19th century sense of the term. And so, uh, so he, uh, wanted to clamp down on any kind of reform movement, uh, and he instituted a number of uh, things that made the the czar's dictatorship extra tyrannical. Uh, one thing was the was uh, he established a secret police that would be very much carried on by the communist regime that comes to power at the by the end of the lesson today, uh, and the secret police uh, would uh, you know keep watch on citizens. Uh, you know, and eventually uh, lead to the arrest and persecution and, and many times execution uh, of any sort of leader who would oppose, or really any sort of citizen that was considered to be leading any sort of opposition party uh, as it pertains to, um, uh, as it pertains to, to the czarist government. So uh, they established this, this uh, and we'll talk more about what the secret police look like in the next lesson that talks about the kind of the Soviet version of that, but it was really, uh, the czars had a version of that as well. Uh, began to do uh, uh, a lot of things uh, that were unpopular. Uh, censorship uh, of written documents increased. Uh, one important, the programs was another important thing. We've talked about that before in class. Uh, about how he began to step up persecution of the Jews, which led an awful lot of Jews to flee Russia. Actually, many of them came to the United States. A significant percentage of the Jewish population of America descended from those that left Russia uh, during uh, what they called the pogroms. Uh, so uh, Alexander III is not a nice guy. He's, he's uh, you know, very dictatorial. He's an old school, absolute monarch. Uh, 
Uh, and we'll see, he becomes extraordinarily unpopular with the people. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this light here. Hold on. I don't know. I can't, I can't see any correlation. To, anyway, never mind. Just ignore the light. If the lighting is weird, I apologize. We'll fix it next time. So, uh, so a bunch of things uh, conspire to make Alexander very unpopular. Uh, one thing that, that uh, is going on during Alexander's time is this issue of uh, industrialization. Russia takes a big step forward to creating a more modern industrial economy. Uh, you know, they build a Trans-Siberian Railway that connects the different uh, uh, parts of Russia, which is, of course, a very large uh, nation. Uh, so there's increasing connectivity as far as that is concerned. Uh, but you have uh, really bad working conditions. They don't allow labor unions at all in Tsarist Russia. Um, so, you know... Basically, the, when we talked about like the early stages of the Industrial Revolution being rough in the Western world, and then we kind of slowly ameliorated them over time, uh, Russia is, as usual, you know, a half a century behind everybody with that. So they're going through the same kind of squalid working conditions and stuff that, that the British had for a brief period of time well before then. So they're kind of behind the curve. Factories are really bad. People are upset. They, they don't like the way things are going. And it leads to a number of different types of revolutionary movement. The revolutionary movement that started to get the, that became the most important, though, was a group known as the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks uh, were followers of the idea of communism that we had talked about a few chapters ago, uh, was the uh, intellectual brainchild of Karl Marx, uh, uh, the German um, a political philosopher, and uh, Friedrich Engels. Uh, Marx, uh, if you remember his philosophy, he looked at all of history in sternly materialistic terms. He said that all of history is a history of class struggle uh, between a group of people that he referred to as the proletariat, which were the worker, the working class, which were the good guys in his version of the story, and the bourgeoisie, who were basically the business owners, who he looked down on. He thought they were selfish. He thought they were greedy. Uh, of course, Marx is a very... Um, you know, is, is a, you know, uh, you know, he's a very, uh, lazy kind of guy. He sits around writing, living off of the work of his friend Ingalls, who's rich off of a factory. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy with Marx and Ingalls, as we talked about. Um, but they, uh, you know, they blamed the ownership class, uh, for all the troubles of the world. Now this is foolish because if not for the ownership class, you know, uh, where are employees going to get jobs, right? I mean, you can't... <laughs> Work has to come from somewhere, and if you're going to have an industrialized economy, you know, there has to be people that own factories and will put up money, you know, if it goes bad. But Marx opposed the capitalist system. He opposed the free enterprise. He didn't like that. He wanted uh, state control. Well, ultimately, he believed that uh, you could have a uh, kind of a state of cooperative anarchy after a period of what he called the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, of course, that's not going to survive contact with human nature. No one's given dictatorial powers uh, and then gives them back up freely. Um, you know, that's just not a common uh, thing in human nature. So uh, Marx's theory was untenable from the beginning. But Marx has had this, Marx had this idea that at some point, um, you know, the workers of the world would unite, they would overthrow the owners of these factories, and they would overthrow the governments of the nation, uh, and they would establish this dictatorship for the workers. Um, so ultimately, uh, you have this group of people called the Bolsheviks that are convinced of Marx's ideas and want to actually put them into practice. And the most, uh, important leader of the Bolsheviks was a fellow by the name of, uh, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, his, his actual given name was Vladimir Uly, uh, Ulyanov. Um, he, uh, took the name Lenin, uh, himself. And uh, Lenin had had a brother who had been hung uh, for conspiring against the Tsar when Lenin was 17. And so at that moment, he became a revolutionary, began to hate the Tsar with a passion, adopted Marxist theory. Uh, he winds up being exiled uh, and has to flee the country to flee uh, the, the Tsarist um, police apparatus. He winds up taking up refuge in Germany for a number of 
of years. Um, and hold that thought because he's going to come back in, in a little while. So meanwhile, while the Bolshevik movement and several other revolutionary or reform movements are gaining ground, you also have a series of things that kind of roil uh, uh, the Russian people. One is the Russo-Japanese War of 1904, uh, where Japan defeats Russia in a war, which is considered a little bit of a national humiliation at the time, along with a lot of people dying in the process of it. And then, uh, and, and the combination of the economic trouble and the Russo-Japanese War and all this stuff leads to an event that they call Bloody Sunday, which happens in 1905 when uh, a, uh, a large, there's large demonstrations uh, in the major cities of Russia. Ultimately, um, the demonstrators are able to convince the Tsar to establish for the first time a Russian parliament, which they called the Duma. And so the Duma is the equivalent of the Estates General in France of the Parliament in England. And it's the first time there's ever existed a legislative body in Russia. Up until this time, Russia is one of the last countries hanging on to like straight up uh, absolute monarchy of this, like you had in the 1700s. Um, and so, uh, so we, we start to have changes in Russia in, in, in the 1900s with the introduction of the Duma and all this stuff. But uh, it's not going to calm... Uh, it's not going to calm the storm. The thing that really puts uh, Russia into a bad way uh, is the disastrous decision to get involved in World War One. Again, like we've we've been over this before, but you know World War One very well could have just been a local war between Austria and Syria, uh, excuse not Syria Serbia, excuse me. Uh, but instead, uh, every country in the world stuck their nose in it. Russia stuck their nose in it because they wanted to, uh, they were in the midst of, you know, it's the era of imperialism and the era of, of, of all that stuff. The Russians wanted to create uh, this sense of being the leader of the, of the Slavic peoples. And because Serbia was a Slavic nation, uh, the Russians wanted to kind of uh, act in defense of the Serbian state. Uh, and so they get involved in World War I, and it is a disaster for the world, as we've talked about, but it is especially a disaster for Russia. Russia takes more damage than anybody else. Uh, four million Russians die uh, in World War I, and uh, the people... Uh, the, the people want out. The fighting on the on the Russian front was just terrible. It's, it's unbelievably cold. The army is undersupplied. Uh, the Germans committed an awful lot of their troops to that side of, of the border while the east or excuse me while the western front stayed in stalemate in the French trenches. Um, and there was just mass death on the Russian border. It was a bad deal. And um, things uh, begin to get, um, uh, things begin to get out of hand with, with people wanting to get out of World War I. Uh, and the combination of there was World War I going on, there's some famine going on, there's the, the issues that they'd already been roiling in, in Russia for decades. Um, you know, the, just the desire for bread is, is a major factor. I mean, there's, there's just there's widespread shortage of food with the war and, and, and all the disasters that are happening. Around this time, an interesting fella steps into the mix. Alexander III goes off to uh, kind of, uh, he le actually leaves the capital city of St. Petersburg to focus his attention on uh, World War I and to, uh, you know, ha uh, be more directly involved with command. And he leaves his wife, uh, he leaves the Tsarina kind of in charge back at the palace of, of, of managing the domestic policy. Well, the Tsarina comes under the influence of this weird figure, this mystery man by the name of Gregory Rasputin. Uh, Rasputin was a wandering monk, uh, and he's he's a weird, weird cat. I, uh, there's accounts of all sorts of, of strange things. He was, um, you know, uh, he was alleged to be able to do all sorts of weird miracles and things. Um, but, uh, you know, a part of me kind of doubts that... Uh, uh, God was doing miracles through him because if you look at his life, it was pretty rough. He was known for some uh, outstanding degrees of perversion and debauchery. Um, uh, so I don't know if he was into some like demonic occult stuff. I, I just don't know. But Rasputin is this weird figure. He He's a kind of a wandering monk, uh, although he never have had an official position in the Russian Orthodox Church. 
Um, but he comes to uh, the forefront uh, of the Russian system at the time because what happens is uh, the Russian czar uh, and Tsarina had a uh, son who had some kind of uh, blood condition, I believe it was hemophilia, and uh, he would have he would have problems. And uh, you know, I don't I don't know what happened. I wasn't there, but the but the Tsar's wife absolutely believed that Rasputin healed the child of uh, of whatever blood disorder it was. And so Rasputin uh, is uh, kind of begins to wield an unbelievable amount of control over the Tsarina, who was in charge of uh, in charge of the situation there in Russia. Um, He's kind of like the power behind the throne, kind of manipulating events the way he wants them to go, uh, and uh, and there's even there's even some rumors that the Tsarina may have had an affair with Rasputin. Rasputin was was uh, known for uh, those sorts of exploits. Um, not not a great guy by any means. Ultimately, uh, Rasputin gets assassinated. Uh, but even that is a weird tale. So uh, the way that uh, so there's a bunch of Russian like noblemen and, and people that supported um, the regime and thought that uh, Rasputin was leading it in a bad direction. They invite him over to a dinner at the noble's house. They uh, feed him food that was poisoned. It doesn't seem to have an effect on him. They shoot the guy three times, uh, th you know, and stab him once. Throw him into the water. Uh, what's funny? They recover his body. There's disputes about what the autopsy found. Some people actually claim that his autopsy said that his cause of death was drowning. After all of that, um, others dispute that. Uh, it's this kind of weird, murky thing. Uh, but you want to talk about overkill? They shot him three times, including once point blank in the head. Uh, they stabbed him. They poisoned him. Uh, they jumped jumped him in the water. Uh, somehow or another, Rasputin got dead. It's just this weird, weird chapter of Russian history, uh, this, this man's influence. Uh, but he was kind of believed to be kind of leading Russia down a bad, bad path. Or at least that's what a lot of the, the nobles thought. So, uh, ultimately, uh, it's, uh, March 1917. Uh, there's a strike in the city of Petrograd. Um, people begin to uh, protest the war. Uh, people begin to uh, protest uh, just the whole system of monarchy. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II uh, ultimately decides that uh, in this March Revolution, he decides to abandon ship. He, he, he quits the throne. And the, they organize a provisional government. The, the idea is Russia is finally going to kind of join the modern world and become a republic. Uh, and so they're going to move into like a parliamentary type system. And uh, the leader who was chosen was a guy by the name of Alexander Kerensky. Well, Kerensky makes a really bad mistake right off the bat, which is he says, you know, we are going to stay in World War I. We've, we've lost too many lives to this war to lose it. We're going to keep fighting. Well, the people did not want to keep fighting. Uh, and Russia was not in condition to still be fighting. Like they were decisively whipped, but Kerensky wouldn't admit it. So they continue to send troops to the to the front to get mowed down by Germans. And this turns out to be a bad deal for a couple of reasons. Uh, first off, this turns public opinion against Kerensky. People want it out. Um, you know, you, no one can explain why they're fighting this war and millions of them are dead now. So people, so that, that turned people against Kerensky. But the second thing that happened was the Germans uh, had a little secret weapon that they deployed against the Russians. And that was Vladimir Lenin. Lenin was in Russia as, uh, as an exile. Excuse me, he was from Russia. He was in Germany as an exile. Uh, and the Germans thought, hmm... We've got an unstable, our, our largest opponent, and, and the one that represents the entirety of our Eastern Front, it kind of has a governmental instability. It'd be a shame if this communist revolutionary just happened to show back up right in time to attack this new weak government. And so Germany actually sends Lenin back to Russia to go cause chaos, and he does. Um, and so the, ultimately the Russian, the Republican government of Russia under Kerensky is going to last less than a year, uh, because there's going to be what they call the Bolshevik revolution, uh, which is where the communist forces really seize power. There were two factions 
within uh, the communist group. There was the Bolsheviks, who were the extreme revolutionaries, and the Mensheviks, who were more moderate. The Mensheviks uh, wanted a more broad base of support, and they kind of wanted to kind of win people over to their cause politically over time. They were still moving toward communism. Uh, the Bolsheviks were hardcore and just wanted to just kill all the capitalists and nobles and, and bring about their so-called workers' paradise, which we'll see was anything but. And communism is the most evil thing that's ever almost been birthed in the history of the earth. Millions of people dead because of this philosophy. It's terrible. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so uh, the Bolsheviks are under the command militarily of a man by the name of Leon Trotsky. He's going to come back up uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but they're headed politically uh, by Lenin. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, there is going to be a war between supporters of uh, the Bolsheviks, who were known as the Reds, uh, and their opponents, who were known as the Whites. Um, and uh, the Whites had many factions. Some of them favored democracy and wanted to continue the Republic. Others were royalists who wanted to restore the Tsar. And then you actually had a handful of socialist who did favor socialist revolution, but wanted it to be done uh, in a less extreme way than what Lenin was proposing. The problem that the white Russians had is they had these three bases of, of support that had a common enemy, but they had nothing in common. Uh, they didn't really agree with each other. Uh, and because of that, they cooperated not anywhere near enough as they ought to have. Um, uh, ultimately, the provisional government topples in, uh, let's see, right around uh, 1917 or eight, November 1917 uh, is when you have uh, armed factory workers storm uh, the palace in Petrograd um, and Kerensky disappears. And then that's kind of when the Bolsheviks take power, which leads us to the next major thing that Lenin did, which was the 1980 Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. We talked about that in the World War One video, uh, but... With that, Russia got out of World War I. In doing so, they agreed to give Germany a huge swath of land, uh, much of which has, has evolved into the modern Baltic nations, like Lithuania, Estonia, uh, also Poland. Um, so Germany is given, uh, some of that is, is, is taken away from Russia. Some of it's given to Germany. Others have becomes independent. But they, they give away a good chunk of land because uh, Lenin just wanted to uh, concentrate on gaining power where he had it. Um, and so, uh, you know, they come in and, and as communists do, they take they basically seize virtually all private property. The philosophy of communism uh, is that, you know, uh, private property was a bad thing, that, that it needs to be managed by the state. So the state seizes control of all the land. They redistrib redistribute much of the land. Um, they redistribute a lot of the farmland. They seize all of the factories from the owners. Um, and begin to operate them as, uh, they say, the workers, but really the state. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Russia's many, many years of, of struggle begin. So, uh, so the Civil War rages during this time. So this is, you know, after all this happens, the whites rise up to oppose the Reds, who had seized power. Um, and uh, the stats on the death toll in the Russian Civil War are really bad. 14 million Russians died in three years. 14 million Russians died in three years. Uh, and this is simultaneous to, um, you know, so you've got the Civil War, you've got the, you know, famine that had already been raging. You've still got Russia's not recovered from World War I yet, and now they're fighting the Civil War that is actually worse. Uh, the communists are killing dissidents. Um, there's, um, uh, this is happening in the midst of the worldwide uh, flu epidemic known as the Spanish flu that hit in 1918 that was similar to like the worst case scenarios of what this corona stuff could be like it's like worse than that yeah it was one of the worst epidemics of modern history so all of this is happening simultaneously and just it's it's a bad time to be a Russian um, lots and lots of people are dying um, during this time uh, ultimately uh, Lenin is going to kind of regain control, and the Russian Revolution is going to be a very radical revolution, more like the French than the American, uh, in that, you know, where the American Revolution was kind of built, it was kind of slowly built on existing British thought patterns and structures, and there wasn't a lot of widespread social upheaval along with the change of government. The French Revolution was more like, we're going to come in and try to undo everything about the way we've been doing society. The Bolshevik Revolution is even more radical than, than probably the French was. Um, uh, it's a very, very radical revolution. Uh, 
Lenin, though, realizes, uh, you know, it's this odd thing, you know, <laughs> communist, a lot of times when it comes down to it, will start to realize that the way they have to bail out their governments is by moving away from communism for periods of a time, and yet they still keep wanting to bring it back, and I, I don't understand that except for it's motivated by desire for power. But uh, Lenin kind of starts to realize that, that this you know, lack of, complete lack of market, complete lack of private property is causing economic devastation. So he backs off for a little while with something that he calls the new economic policy or the NEP. Uh, up until the NEP, like if you were a Russian peasant, you could raise enough food for yourself, but any excess food you couldn't sell, you had to turn it over to the government so they could, re you know, redistribute it wherever they wanted to. Um, so he allowed people to actually sell excess crops. He allows a little bit more private property. The Russian economy recovers a little bit. Still not good, uh, but it recovers a little bit from where it was. It's enough to stabilize uh, the regime and kind of earn them, you know, uh, stronger control. Uh, then you're going to have, uh, you know, he's going he's, he's gonna to try to figure out how he's going to um, deal with the issue of nationalism because remember nationalism has been the decisive issue of the last hundred years of European history. He knows that it's possible that, that with all the different ethnic groups that were in Russia between Ukrainians and Cossacks and Georgians and Armenians and you can go on and on, uh, that many of them may choose this moment to try to gain revolution he, uh, or gain independence. Uh, Lenin wanted to head that off at the past so he reorganized Russia into uh, what he calls the, the Soviet Union uh, the Soviet Union or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR. So if if at any time over the rest of the course, because they're going to be a major factor in the rest of the course, uh, anytime you hear me refer to the Soviet Union or the USSR, uh, you know, that's basically synonymous with, with Russia, but not technically. Russia becomes the largest state in a confederation of communist states known as uh, Soviets. And they, they, where the word Soviet came from, Sovi the Soviets were these revolutionary councils uh, that were established in local areas by red sympathizing Russians during Kerensky's short-lived tenure uh, in office. And in a lot of cases, these local Soviets uh, actually had more authority in, in local government than the established government did. And so that's, uh, so they became a major part of uh, the Soviet mythology or the, or the Russian communist mythology. Um, and so they wanted to rename these republics Soviets. So they called them the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, now, they're a republic in no way. <laughs> There's Whatever they're calling a republic, you know, uh, anytime you hear a country called the People's Republic of anything, know that it has nothing to do with people or republics. Um, you know, the, the Republican theorists that we think of in, in terms of like guys like John Locke and stuff like that, this has no, re <laughs> no relation to that at all. So uh, they use that language, though, for the sake of um, PR more than anything else. So they call themselves the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And uh, they establish uh, one-party rule. There's only one party, the Bolsheviks, who renamed themselves the Communist Party. Uh, the term communism was used in Karl Marx's writings to describe what he believed would be the final state of the world when the workers gain control. So they, they called themselves the Communist Party. Uh, and the Communist Party came in, crushed all dissent. You were not allowed to have any position in government if you weren't a member of the party. No opposition parties, no free elections. Uh, really, the only way to gain any sort of power or influence in the country was to be a party officer. Uh, and if you seemed, if at any time you seemed disloyal to the party, uh, you know, you were at some point going to be sent off to prison camps uh, that they referred to as the gulags. We'll talk about that more in the next video. Uh, you know, they wound up establishing religious persecution, um, ter you know, moving against traditional family unit, moving against traditional education. I mean, trying to overdo, undo everything. True totalitarian regime, meaning they try to order every aspect of society to be in accordance with Soviet political philosophy, uh, which was diehard communism. Um, the one thing where, uh, you know, Lenin's thought may have varied a little from Marx's, well, there's a couple of things. One uh, was that um, Marx really thought that this was going to be a kind of spontaneous workers' revolution. Lenin said, no, the, the, um, 
that's not going to happen. There has to be a revolutionary vanguard. There has to be someone to kind of lead the peasants into their revolution. And, you know, he volunteered. Um, and then Lenin is going to very much have this idea of trying to spread it worldwide. Uh, and, and so the Soviet Union is a very aggressively expansionistic nation. Not only do they want to expand their borders for just the sake of their own power, they also try to expand communist regimes in other places. They try to support communist revolution in other places. They establish something known as the Third International, which was an international communist terrorist organization, uh, which, which fuels communist revolution across the globe. Uh, and uh, this is going to lead, after World War II, uh, to the beginning of what we call the Cold War. Uh, where America and the Soviet Union really kind of compete for the destinies of the rest of the world to a great extent. Uh, and America tried to stop, uh, tried a little bit to stop the Soviets from from taking power. We contributed some military aid to the White Russians in the Russian Civil War because we, you know they were allies in World War One. We didn't want them to drop out. Uh, didn't work. Um, ultimately, you know, it, it wasn't enough to overcome uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, Lenin is a uh, is a uh, terrible dictator, terrible human being, murders millions, uh, brings lots of people to their deaths, brings lots of people to you know spend their life in prison. Um, but he's actually not going to be the leader of the Soviet Union for uh, an extended period of time. He, uh, he suffers a stroke uh, in the late 1920s. Uh, let me double check the date. I believe it was 1922. Okay, so... Uh, so after Lenin's stroke, uh, the two possible successors uh, start competing for who is going to be in position to take over when Lenin dies. On one hand, you have Leon Trotsky, who was um, probably the favorite communist of academics. Uh, and he was um, the leader of the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. And in many ways would have been the logical choice to replace uh, Lenin. But there was one guy who could out-nasty the nastiest. Even Lenin, who was one of the most evil men in the world, uh, was kind of scared of this guy that emerges. And his name uh, is Joseph Stalin. Uh, Stalin was not actually his real name. It was an assumed name like Lenin was. Uh, he picked up the name Stalin, which actually meant uh, uh, man of steel. Uh, in the language of his native Georgia, the country, not not like Atlanta, Georgia, but uh, there's a country in Georgia, uh, there's a country called Georgia in Eastern Europe that was a part of the USSR. That's where Stalin was from. Stalin, uh, we'll talk more about how he accomplishes this uh, in the next video, but Stalin starts a march through the party ranks using uh, just tactics of extreme brutality and cruelty he takes when he finally does become the leader of the ussr he takes totalitarianism to a brand new height um you know he and hitler are pretty much tied for the big bad guy of all of the 20th century's history in my opinion um he, he's absolutely on the same level statistically did more damage um hitler was maybe a little more uh I don't know, he, he took maybe a little more pleasure in what he did. Uh, Stalin was a little more businesslike. But either way, it's a bad deal. Lots of people, uh, lots of innocent people murdered uh, for their refusal to buy into their belief system. Um, and and, and uh, lots of Christians in particular uh, prosecuted, actually, actually under both of them, especially under Stalin. Um, you know, Hitler at least kind of pretended to tolerate the church, although you had to basically teach Nazism and pretend it's Christianity. But in, in the Soviet Union, Stalin starts, you know, really establishing an atheist state intentionally. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of mass murder, a lot of bad things happen. Uh, and Stalin is going to gain the upper hand over Trotsky. And when Lenin dies in 1928, if I recall correctly, uh, then Stalin is going to assume uh, the position of the leadership of the Soviet Union. Uh, Trotsky, his primary rival, uh, winds up dead uh, in a Mexico City hotel room with an ice pick to the back of his neck. Uh, not a pleasant way to go, uh, but he had fled, uh, he had fled uh, Russia trying to find uh, you know, refuge somewhere else, and uh, Stalin considered him a threat to come, try to come back and take the, the throne from him. Um, and so uh, he actually has the KGB track him down he was, uh, you know, uh, in Latin America, potentially 
trying to nurse some Marxist revolution over there. Uh, and so in a Mexico City hotel room, a KGB agent actually takes him out uh, with a crowbar. Um, excuse me, an ice pick. Um, yeah, not, not, a good, not a good way to go. Um, but anyway, so Stalin uh, gains control of the Soviet Union uh, by the late 1920s. And as we're going to see, uh, he turns it into um, one of the most hellish... Uh, conditions that we've ever seen uh, in the modern world. Uh, and we will talk about that uh, next. So on that pleasant note, uh, y'all have yourselves a good, uh, uh, a good time, and uh, hopefully I'll get to see you before the year's out.